podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Season 2 Official Smart People Podcast. I'm Chris Stemp. And I'm John Rojas. And yes, we got renewed for Season 2. Yeah, we did. The The sponsors liked us. Um, we, You know, what happened was, I don't know if some of you might have been following us on Twitter and Facebook, but... John and I moved, and we have a new studio now. It's coming together really nicely. And so we used that as an excuse to take an official hiatus, really figure out where we wanted to take the podcast, get some awesome interviews in the hopper. And we have done that. And uh, today, you won't be disappointed with the first one of the new season. It is killer. We'll get to that in a little bit. First, feel free to check us out at smartpeoplepodcast.com and see what we're all about, what we do. Go ahead and look at some of the interviews in the past if you haven't seen them. If you have seen and heard all of them, thanks for being a loyal listener. Yes, and click that Amazon banner at the top of the page. You guys can make your Amazon purchases and give us a little bit of uh, coin in the pocket, and we greatly appreciate it. All of you have been doing that even while on the hiatus. We're hugely thankful for we saw a little bit of uh money rolling in while we were taking a break and we used that yeah and it's not for the new studio they're not really giving us anything just when you make your purchases they're they're supporting the show and we get a kickback yeah the easiest way possible it doesn't cost them anything they're using amazon amazon's cheap amazon's awesome yeah and we're getting with that money as as roach mentioned we're getting new mics we're getting a soundboard we're gonna do some stuff it's not like we take a dime of it and go to the bar it's all being reinvested into this to hopefully bring you better sound better guests better everything so again really appreciate that we're also on facebook we're approaching 2,000 likes which is also the coolest thing ever check us out and twitter at smart people pod yeah tell your friends on facebook link to our facebook page get more and more people checking us out yeah so i'm i'm excited to be back i'm really pumped i am too and with this new season and getting to buy new equipment i'm doubly pumped well you're geeking out you're like hey let's buy 400 dollar microphones i'm like hey, there we, goes our entire budget we scaled it back <laughs> yeah we did it, and i couldn't even be more excited to start off season two with a topic that is so near and dear to us and I'm sure thousands of you out there that listen, I'm going to go ahead and throw out there that the beginning title of the book is The Defining Decade. I'm not going to tell you right at this moment what decade that is. Just think about it. What kind of defines you as a person as you grow up? What do you think, Roach? You're going to have to tell them in like five seconds. Why? Because of the subtitle? Yeah. Okay. All right. So the subtitle is Why Your 20s Matter and How to Make the Most of Them Now. So it is your 20s. So if you're 30, you're screwed. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We we um we actually talk about that. It's the first question I asked. Squash her. that myth. Yep. Yeah. Um, this can help you all through life. I mean, if you are in your 20s or about to be, it might be the best time to pick this up. And by the way, the author, Meg J, is the one we're interviewing. She's amazing. One of the coolest people we talk to. So personable, obviously, because she talks to people every day. But uh, the book's incredible. And, you know, maybe you have a kid that's going to be 20 soon. And she will tell you what not to tell your child because you're probably wrong. Like, you're going to give them bad advice. So I would recommend picking this up. Why don't we go ahead and give away a couple copies? That's a great idea. So Let's do that. Yeah, um, we have a couple. They were nice enough to ship us some. So if you are in your 20s and terrified, here's a roadmap. If you're in your 40s and you're about to have a 20-year-old kid, here's a roadmap. Or if you just are interested in these types of things, why don't you hit us up on Facebook or Twitter or uh, there's a contact us at the website, smartpeoplepodcast.com, and we'll send you out a free copy. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and say this. If anybody takes a picture of themselves listening to our podcast and posts it on their wall, you'll probably be the winner. Okay, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. You win. Again, this week we talk with Meg Jay, author of The Defining Decade, Why Your 20s Matter, and How to Make the Most of Them Now. Meg is a clinical psychologist who specializes in adult development and 20-somethings in particular. 
She's an assistant clinical professor at the University of Virginia and maintains a private practice in Charlottesville, Virginia. She earned her doctorate in clinical psychology and in gender studies from University of California, Berkeley. You might have heard of it. It is for smart people only. Sometimes we require you go to a nice college to be on the show, but not all the time. Meg's incredible. The book's amazing. I feel like I need to listen to the podcast three times and reread the book just to help me in my life. So I'm sure it can help you guys out in one way or another. All right, guys. Well, it's definitely good to be back and enjoy the first episode of season two. The first question I had for you before we kind of dive into things is, Mm -hmm. I, you know, I was telling my friends we were going to interview you and talk about your book, The Defining Decade, um, which is the subtitle, Why Your 20s Matter and How to Make the Most of Them Now. And most of my friends are in their late 20s, if not just turning 30, and they all immediately had the same response. They got depressed. (laughs) They they did. Because whether you feel like you wasted your 20s or not, if you're at that age, they're over and they were like, oh, what do I do? So before we Uh dive in, how can all ages, because this podcast appeals to a wide age range, how can they benefit from what they'll read in your book and what they'll hear on the, in the interview and things like that? Right. Well, you know, I hear that a lot. It's interesting because you talk to a 20 or a 21 year old about the book and they say, oh, well, I mean, I'm only 20. I don't need to, I don't need to make the most of things yet. Right. And then you talk to someone who's 29 and they go, oh gosh, it's too late for me. Um, So, you know, the truth is it's never too early. It's never too late. And the great thing about working with 20 somethings, including 29 year olds and, you know, plus or minus error, we could be talking about 31-year-olds too, is that it's that young adulthood is when people change quickly. And life's most defining decisions haven't most all been made. They're maybe on the verge of being made, but um, it's not too late for a 29-year-old or a 31-year-old. I have gotten lots of emails from 30-somethings and even from 60-somethings who bought the book for their kids but then said, I'm getting so much out of this book because it's really about adult development. The idea is let people who are just starting adulthood know as soon as possible how to make the most of their lives, but it's good for any age. So you're saying it's still not too late for us. <laughs> it's not too late. I'm Perfect. in my 40s, and I haven't given up hope on myself either, so um, nice. it's not too late at all. Well, before we dive deeper into the book, I just wanted to ask you a quick question about your background and just talk to you a little bit about what you do now and how you got to the position that you're in, you know, how you figured out what your passion was and took the steps to getting there. Well, uh, I went to undergrad at UVA, which is actually where I am again now, but um, I didn't start off as a psych major. I started off, I think I was probably thinking about law school, and I really can't remember why I would have been thinking that. (laughs) But at some point during college, I realized I love my psychology classes. I would look forward to the reading. I enjoyed what I was learning. Why aren't I doing something like that? Um, so I changed to be a psych major and I remember people around me said, Oh, what are you going to do with a psych major? You'll never make any money. You'll never have a career. Um, you know, I'm sure you all have heard things like that in your life of it. It's, you know, it's got to be pre-med or engineering or you're sunk, but it was clear. That's what I enjoyed. So that's what I was going to do. And I would just take it step by step. So I got a psych major, um, loved what I studied. And after school, um, you'll read in in the book, I went to work for Outward Bound right directly after graduation. And to me, that was sort of a bargain of, on the one hand, I was exploring and having adventures, which is a lot of what 20-somethings want to do. On the other hand, I was earning what's called identity capital, which is doing something that was going to help me get the next job interview because a lot of people think working for Outward Bound is great. And it gave me um, experience with special populations like Vietnam vets or survivors of violence adjudicated youth. So I did that for a few years um, and just got some life experience knowing grad schools appreciate that, employers appreciate that. And then after a few years doing that, I went back to grad school At that point, I was sure that's what I wanted to do. Um, I'd kind of had enough of making no money and feeling frustrated (laughs) and knew I needed to 
push the peanut forward on my career. So I went back to grad school. I went to Berkeley um, and got a PhD there, which is, you know, one of the longest, hardest routes you could take to doing what I do. Um, but it was worth it in a lot of ways. It was great training and, again, more really good identity capital that's helped me get things. Um, but there's many routes to working with people um, clinically. It doesn't have to be a PhD at a big research school. And then by the time I was done there, again, I wasn't sure what population I would work with during grad school, but by the time I was out, I had settled on um, adult development and especially young adult development and 20-something. So that's what I've been doing ever since. It's great. Um, I'm back at UVA now really for lifestyle reasons. My husband and I decided to move back to the east and you know have our lives here and i can understand wanting to live in charlottesville it's a beautiful city so (laughs) it's really nice it's really nice and it's you know berkeley was a great place to live but it's you know as you can imagine it's not as easy to kind of set up shop and have a house and a family and all that as it is in charlottesville isn't berkeley full of hippies (laughs) (laughs) actually I didn't mind that so much yeah. having been at Outward Bound for five years yeah. but um, you know it's 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 really it wasn't the hippies it was just the cost of living was more of what drove me away right. so that's funny now you touched on a phrase a couple times there of identity capital and this was something uh-huh. that immediately jumped out to me when I was reading through the information and through the book can you explain that concept of identity capital real quick yeah, identity capital, it's actually a term from a sociologist um, named James Cote, and um, he talks about identity capital being the things that we do or the investments we make or the things that we're good at that are sort of our personal bling. There are our personal bullet points of who we are and what we're bringing to a situation or what we're bringing to the world. And so it, I have found it useful working with 20-somethings who often feel like the point of the 20s is to have a big identity crisis. And it's about kind of confusion and searching rather than about identifying and building. And so I really work with them around, okay, crisis is fine. But the other, the flip side of that coin is getting some capital along the way of while you're doing things to search or explore or try out different jobs, be sure that you're earning identity capital, something that make someone lean forward in an interview and say, oh, tell me about doing that, or, oh, I hear you're good at this, because that's how that's how people make sense of us, is through the bits and pieces that make us who we are. So, I mean, there's a big difference between, you know, two uh, kind of beginner jobs, two starter jobs, you know, one has capital, one doesn't have capital. The big difference is, you know, one's going to lead to the next job and the other one's going to feel kind of like it's keeping you stuck. You know, what's interesting there is I think about this a lot in your 20s, or at least in my 20s, I want to do things that I could learn from and I wasn't necessarily as concerned about, is it going to get me to the next step? And I feel like Mm -hmm. that might be important, but it's tough to balance and it causes a lot of stress if you have to make a decision, okay, this is going to look good for my next employer, but I might not love it. And then this I might love doing, but it's not going to look good or it's not the top choice. How do you balance or how do you recommend balancing that? Um, You try, (laughs) but I think it's a a great way to think about it, of balancing crisis and capital, balancing sort of utility and passion. Um, I mean, for me, that balance was outward bound of, I had a great time. I traveled with other people my age and, you know, had big chunks of time off. And we went all over the country and different places in the world. But I knew it was going to help me. I knew it was going to look good. So that was that kept some of the stress off. And, you know, that's not obviously going to be outward bound is not the solution for everyone. But I think either you try to find something that has an intersection of what you love and what you want to try and what actually might help you move a little bit forward. Or you split the two and you one is work and one is a hobby or you have two pursuits where you've got one job that's, you know, maybe 
you know, a little utilitarian and you have another job, you know, I, I know and have clients who are pursuing things on the side, like trying to write um, pilots for television shows or get going on their blog or doing podcasts. And you, you try to find ways to have them both going. No, that's a good point. And actually, we're kind of talking about it. So I'll go ahead and ask in my opinion, what is the million-dollar question in your 20s, specifically your early 20s, maybe even earlier? How do you recommend finding what you should do? I mean, so many people here, I heard a million times, find your passion, do what you love, wake up every day and want to go to work. What would you do for free? And I mean, what I didn't realize is, unless I'm playing baseball or something crazy, there's not much that I would do for free. At least, at least I don't know. So how do we take those steps to find that? Yeah, I mean, I, I talk about that in, in the defining decade. I think that lottery question of, you know, what you should do with your life is what you would do if you won the lottery. Um, I mean, that's kind of a silly question that I think a better question is, what would you like to do with your life if you didn't win the lottery? So let's say that windfall is never coming. What kind of work will you enjoy? Because you're going to have to be doing it a lot to kind of earn your way through life. Would you enjoy doing enough that you're going to do it, you know, for quite some time in some form or another? Um, and what's going to help you kind of earn the sort of life that you need so you're not living under the constant stress of the daily hassles of having, you know, no means? And so I think the idea of find your passion is oversimplified and a little misleading. And a lot of people feel like they're, you know, searching under every rock for their passion. Um, but it's more of pay attention to what you've done so far that's made you happy that you've also done well, that's allowed you to kind of live the life that you want. And you, you just build on what you know. Um, most people know where to start, actually. Great. Now so, you made me feel terrible. <laughs> why? <laughs> why? I have no idea where to start. I was like, finance. I don't believe that at all. I, I won't, uh, <laughs> we won't have a, you know, make you have a session on a podcast right now, but I don't believe that. Yeah. You do know where to start. Yeah. It's funny, actually, because just getting your book and, and taking a look at it, I mean, it's phenomenal. Again, it's the defining decade. It already took some of the anxiety away. I wish I would have read it a long time ago because knowing that there are things you can do, you know, books you can read like this, people you can talk to like yourself, it helps build a roadmap. And what I wanted to talk about was anxiety in general is something that I think can define a lot of your 20s only because, I mean, when you think about the decisions you make, it's uh, who might I marry or at least who am I looking mm -hmm. at to marry or mm -hmm. where am I going to live or what am I going to do forever, basically. All mm -hmm. these things. And then add that to the fact that, and I also want to touch on through my own research, I know that in your early 20s, you're most likely to have the chemical changes that can lead to anxiety, depression. Mm -hmm. So not only do you have all these decisions, your body is like, hey, here you go. Deal with this also. <laughs> and so, right. so, you know, I'm sure you see a lot of anxious young adults. How do you help them? What do you recommend? Is it structure? Is it go be free? You know, what kind of things do you mm -hmm. try and tell them? Um, a few things. I mean, you, you bring up a great point, which is that I think some people's initial reaction to what I'm saying with, hey, this is a defining decade, they go, oh my gosh, this is stressing me out. It's so much pressure. But actually, most people's reaction to reading the book is, I feel so relieved because somebody has, is talking about the elephant in the room, which is, what that my life matters that what I'm doing is important and this person's taking me seriously and I talk about what 20 somethings actually do to get through the anxiety that goes along with life being so uncertain so yes I think it is relieving when people take 20 something seriously and say I want to have a serious conversation with you about what you're doing because it does matter I mean these aren't the last choices you're ever going to make but these choices do matter, and let's get you off to a good start. Um, a lot of the work I do in helping people with the anxiety that goes along with so much uncertainty is, is twofold. One is learning to tolerate anxiety because a lot of 20-somethings, like really all adults, um, they want certainty, they want guarantees, they want black and whites and right answers. And you know, part of being an adult is realizing that's never coming. 
yeah. that you'll never know if you married the right person <laughs> or not. I read this great um, article about marriage, and they said something like, a real marriage starts the day you, you wake up and wonder if you've made a mistake. Oh, my and, God. I read um, the same thing. I seriously yes, just read that. Think, oh, I can't remember where it was from, but I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, it was in Psychology Today. It yes, was. It was a was. cover story yes, there. It and it's so true because you'll never know that with certainty that this is the right career of all the ones I could have done or this is the right person. But so part of it is tolerating an anxiety and that's what 20 somethings are often learning to do is how to calm themselves down, how to deal with distress and uncertainty and the fact that things are going to unfold slowly. Um, the other part is making your own certainty where you can, which means, empower yourself with information about how do I choose a good partner? How do I start a career? How do I build the life that I want? So I try to balance with people making your own certainty through making choices that are good ones and um, also recognizing that nothing is ever completely certain. Yeah. And you mentioned the anxiety from relationships and starting families and things along those lines. Do you see a lot of 20-somethings that are coming in? I'll probably put myself into the same category that would come in and say, I'm 28, I'm 29. The thought of having a baby or a family terrifies me at this point. And, <laughs> and, and you know, you, you mentioned you know, not to believe that 30 is the new 20, and I see exactly where you're coming from, but I keep telling myself that I have more and more time, but then the more I look into it, it's, you know, girls become less and less fertile throughout their right. early 30s. They have their clock. Yeah, they've got their yeah. clock. I, I'm sure I have some type of clock. It's probably not as strict as, <laughs> as females, uh -huh. but... I'm closely approaching that age and right. it still it still terrifies me to think, oh, there's there's no way I could raise a child. I would something terrible would happen. <laughs> do you do, I mean, do you have a lot of 20 somethings that come in and say the same things to you? Uh, or do I yes. need to schedule some type of appointment <laughs> with you, I guess? <laughs> I've never heard that before. No, <laughs> I I do. I, um I hear both sides. I hear 23 year olds who say oh my gosh I'm never going to get this done in time what if I you know I'm 40 and I'm single and I have no kids and I say we've got 17 years to work this out <laughs> I am sure that we can work this out um, and I have 29 year olds who say I don't want to think about my clock because it's ticking faster than I feel like I'm getting ready. And, and I right. think, um, you know, that, that there's a, a range of reactions to the idea that, okay, I probably want a family at some point. So what am I going to do about that? And when that's part of kind of the anxiety of being a 20 something is when do I start thinking about that? But, you know, the good news is, you know, in, in the defining decade, at no point do I say, Everybody has to have kids by 30. I say, if you want a partner, if you want a family, you should know about some things that get tricky by and beyond your mid-30s. And then you have to do some reverse engineering of, okay, so you just said, I don't want a baby right now. I'm 29, and that's fine by me. But if you think you want one in the next or, you know, if you want in five years, maybe you think, well, yeah, I could entertain that idea in five years. If you reverse engineer a little bit, you say, okay, well, now would be the time to start dating people that you that could actually imagine doing that with, <laughs> or even trying to start dating people, because that can be a shift from dating people who totally don't matter, and you're just trying to have a good time, to dating people that you actually take seriously as a partner. That would be more of what I'm saying. Well, are you ready for that? That's deep. <laughs> I was just thinking. Well, cause... I won't make you answer on the uh, <laughs> podcast here. But um, so I guess, you know, the answer to your question is it's okay if you're not ready for a family. But if you know you want one someday, you kind of reverse engineer to, you know, what do I what do I start now or do I need to start taking even just dating seriously now or partnering seriously now? That's a, I mean, that's a great point. Both Chris and I just have wide eyes just <laughs> staring at each other right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I guess. And then while, point. while we're on the, on the subject, you've talked to, I'm sure thousands of people in their twenties who are going through men and women. And I don't claim to know women at all. I gave up. <laughs> I don't have any sisters. Like I just don't know. So from both perspectives, 
what kind of advice do you give most on, hey, you know, dating, finding the person right for you? Is it the person you're most attracted to or is it your best friend, obviously, that everybody talks about? Or what kind of mm-hmm. advice do you give and, and the responses you hear? You know, it's a little bit like balancing crisis and capital. I mean, I think you've you've got to have, there's got to be some chemistry. It can't just be a business arrangement. You know, there's <laughs> got to be some chemistry, but it's also got to work, you know, when the, I mean, the rubber's got to hit the road on the relationship, that it's one thing to have great chemistry with somebody, but if you're constantly fighting or they're, you know, they're here and there and it's up and down all the time, that's not going to work either and usually doesn't make people happy. So what I do with 20-somethings and really of all age, I mean, of male, female, all years within the 20-somethings, they almost all respond well to the idea that to take your relationships seriously in terms of what is it that I want and let me make sure I'm I'm getting that from the other person. And if you decide that what you want is a year of not worrying about it or just having a good time or taking a complete break, fine, um, but really being a little bit more honest with what you're hoping to get from a partner. Um, a lot of the clients I have feel like they haven't been allowed to – say, I want something. I'm actually looking for something. They pretend that they're not, and then they get frustrated when it doesn't turn into something more. Um, And that causes a lot of arguments and frustration and heartbreak. I'm sure you all have seen that or been on the receiving end of that before. People who say, it's fine, it's fine, we'll keep it casual, but then they're frustrated that you're not giving them what they want. Uh, Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Story of our lives. (laughs) Does that sound familiar? (laughs) flipping through the book too I came across the cohabitation effect Mm -hmm. and I hated reading that part because I've had this huge ongoing argument with my mom for the longest time saying that now because people are getting married later and that kind of stuff we have to live together to see if it would work and all that and after reading what you wrote it makes me realize that that is the furthest thing from the truth because you mentioned, you know, people settling and, and mm-hmm. sliding and, and that kind of stuff. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, cohabitation effect and what you yeah. talk about it in the book? Yeah, the cohabitation effect, that's a term uh, re- sociological researchers and psychological researchers have used for the finding that um, in, in some groups or sort of some forms of cohabitating, that living together before you have a clear commitment like you're engaged or you're married, it can lead to being less happy with your relationship, being less committed, and even if you go on to get married, feeling less committed and ultimately maybe even divorcing. So um, I think for me what was important about writing that chapter, and I'm very clear about it, that I'm not for or against cohabiting, and I lived with my husband before we got married, Um, as much as I am for educating 20-somethings that there are upsides and there are downsides. So they've all heard the upsides like you're talking about of, oh, well, I can test out my relationship and I'll know my partner better if we live together than if we just, you know, go to bars or go to the movies or go to restaurants together. And that's true. You'll know your partner better. It's cheaper to live together. It's fun. Um, But you have to be aware of the downsides, not so that you necessarily never live with anybody, but so that you can do a gut check on, am I falling into the traps here? So the biggest traps are um, what's called sliding and not deciding, feeling like, well, living together, it's an easy in, it's an easy out. So uh, it doesn't even, it doesn't really matter who I live with. It's no big deal. So we can kind of slide into living with people that we don't even value very highly or that we don't even necessarily want to be with. It just feels like an easy commitment. Um, and the the other downside kind of comes from that, and that's something called lock-in, and that's when you combine pets and furniture and friends and routines, it becomes harder to get out than you might anticipate. So what I have seen, I cannot count how many times in my office are people who say, I wasted half of my 20s living with some person I shouldn't have been with more than, you know, a year or 18 months. Um, But because they were living together, they got stuck. Um, And maybe they didn't go on to get married and get divorced or whatever, but even so, Something that should have gone on a year went on five years because they moved in together and couldn't get out as easily as they thought they they could. So 
I thought it was important because most when I talk to 20-somethings or even the graduate students I train who are working with 20-somethings, I talk to them about this. They're just wide-eyed of, I never even thought about that. And I think that once people know it, they can do a real gut check on, am I still with this person because I am still trying this out for the future or am I with this person because I don't want to go buy a new couch or get a new apartment right. and that, that's, that happens a lot yeah no that's awesome I, yes, I I've heard this before you know the whole thing about living together and how it might not be good but I never thought about the reasoning and that all makes sense so thank you for clarifying and I know you go uh, into much more depth in the book so definitely gonna take a deeper dive in there want to switch gears real quick and talk about something that I hear all the time now, and I think if you, even when you're older, you can look back and wonder, at some point in their 20s, I feel like every single person says, forget it, I'm out, this work thing is not for me, I'm going to be a monk, or I'm moving to Australia, or a farmer, or something. I mean, it just is. And so along those lines, for somebody that says, I want to take time off, I want to create or I want to learn about myself. Do you think, is that a cop-out? Is that a good idea? What is your response to that? Um, My response to that is I think self-awareness is always a good idea. Um, And the second part of that response is self-awareness is not a 24-7, 10-year job. So um, I think sometimes people are a bit black and white about the 20s. And interestingly, I don't think 20-somethings are as as fault for this as older generations who idealize the 20s is this great time where you're going to go out and you're going to explore and you're going to backpack for 10 years and because (laughs) you did that you're going to have a better career and a better marriage and a better everything Um, that is a fantasy that that's a baby boomer fantasy (laughs) that people have um, because you know they did get married at 21 right after college and have their kids and whatever and you know Fortunately, 20-somethings now have a lot of other choices. They don't have to have lives, you know, where everything's determined within a year out of college. But this idea that um, it's one or the other, that you can't, you know, really think about what might I like to do for work? Because we do know people who have jobs that they like are happier than people who don't or people who don't work at all even. Um, that people who have relationships they feel good about are happier than people who are chronically single. That's what the research says, and that's what my clients say. So I think you can get going on work and on love, and self-awareness can be part of that, and maybe you do try, you know, what do you say, move move to Australia yeah. or whatever. Maybe you try some of these things, but it doesn't have to be one or the other. There's time for all of that in, in the 20s. I was on a radio show recently, and this guy called in, and he said, I'm 65, and my knees are going, and I tell every 20-something out there to just backpack until you're 30 and then start your life. And I said, well, are you going to give them all jobs yeah. <laughs> You know, yes. when they turn yes. 30 and they, they haven't done anything yeah. in nine years and everybody looks sideways at them? Are you going to give them jobs? You know, um, that there's, there's got to be some balance. That's awesome. That's that perfect. That's perfect advice. I'm so I'm I'm impressed. <laughs> My interests really lie within technology, social media, and all this cool stuff that's come out in the last ten years or so. Great. Right. And now that I look at it, I start to wonder if all that stuff, the social media and technology actually makes our lives worse as opposed to better that we think it does. For example, I just came across an article the other day and somebody created this game called the phone stack game. And what it is, is when you go out to dinner with your friends, everybody stacks your phone in the middle of the table. Okay. And if, if anybody grabs their phone to answer a call, an email, text message, whatever it may be, look something up, they have to pick up the tab. Oh, and that's good. I thought it was a great idea, but so then cool. I then I thought about it and I was like, why do we even have to come up with the phone stack game? Like it's ridiculous that yeah. we have to come up with a game that keeps people paid attention to each other as opposed to, you know, tied to the internet and their phone. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you see with the twenty somethings and do you think it's actually causing more depression and anxiety with us than benefiting our lives like we're told that these products are supposed to do? Mm-hmm. You know, it depends. It, you know, I, I come down in the same place I, I come down with 
cohabitation. It depends on how you do it. It depends on how you use it. And it depends on how aware you are of the drawbacks. So you can say, I got to make sure I'm not doing that. So, um, you know, one thing I talk about in the defining decade is Facebook, um, that I, not because I'm for or against Facebook, but because a lot my clients talk to me a lot about Facebook and, that they go on there at night and they're sitting on their couch in their sweatpants eating a lean cuisine and they're surfing Facebook and they feel terrible about their lives doing that because they feel like, look at me, I've got nothing going on and look at, it's me versus my 314 (laughs) friends who all are doing swimmingly apparently from the pictures. And so I think um, just being aware of what the different forms of social media open us up to. So with Facebook, I think, for 20-somethings, being aware of what's called upward social comparisons where when you compare yourself to people who seem higher or better or who are doing better, um, I mean, Facebook is is really a setup for an upward social comparison. So that doesn't mean you can't be on it, but just be aware of, okay, I can't bombard myself tonight with 500 upward social comparisons before I go to bed. That How could I possibly feel okay going to sleep like that. Um, So some people have to have a real conscious relationship with Facebook and maybe they take breaks or they say, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I came on here to do for five minutes and then I'm getting off, you know, other forms of media, Twitter. um, I'm on both of these because of the book. um, But that's been interesting. I wasn't before because as a therapist, I, I used to have a low profile. Um, That has changed (laughs) in the last two months, but um, you know, I think Twitter is really fun and it's a great source of information. It can also, you know, keep us very distracted when we have a dissertation we're supposed to be working on or a cover letter we're supposed to be writing. And so, you know, I think it's it's like television. If television came along and everybody said, this is great. We're just going to park our kids in front of it morning, noon, and night. What could be wrong with that? And then over time you realize it's got its pros and cons and you have to have a more conscious relationship with television. It's the same for social media. Now, you mentioned upward social comparison, and I have to ask, what is the opposite of that? Because, you know, you've got myself... Oh, it's a downward social comparison. I mean, and that's why people say, get out there and, you know, do some volunteer work and help people who are not as fortunate as you. It sounds cliche, but that's a downward social comparison. So you go out in the world and, you know, you volunteer somewhere at a homeless shelter or you volunteer at a free clinic and you realize, whoa, I'm a lot better off than I realized. And I forget that when I compare myself to people who are just at the top of their game all the time. That's a downward social comparison. Okay, that that definitely makes sense. I think I might have phrased that question wrong because I'm trying to say like who is on the opposite side of the upward social comparison because I, when I'm sitting here and I'm looking at people's pictures of all their kids and all that kind of stuff and people going on vacations and doing whatever, is there some type of definition for why people post so many pictures of their kids and their families and that kind of stuff? I'm not trying to make any of my friends mad because I have a lot of friends that do this, but I always wonder, there's like some type of race out there for people to see who can post the most pictures of their babies. Right. Or who has the cutest kids. Right. Um, You know, well, okay. So I get it now. What you mean is what's on the other side of that that profile page that looks awesome. Um, Well, you know, my clients are also very honest about the fact that they intentionally post you know, the picture where they look really cute or where they, their baby looks really cute or they look really thin or they're standing around with all the hot girls or whatever, that people are very clear and very honest with me in session about the fact that these are what one of my clients calls his self-advertisement, that this is not a fair and accurate representation of his life or my other clients' lives, but, but I think people do feel compelled to put their best foot forward in the most ex- extreme way when it's it's about pictures and looks and comparisons. Yeah, I was going to say it's um, kind of like a McDonald's advertisement where you see the, the Big Mac pounder. or the quarter pounder that looks perfect and pristine, <laughs> but then when you go to this actual restaurant, it you know it looks like garbage. Right. Um, Did you just compare your friends to Big Mac on Facebook? And, and garbage? <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know. Well, it's <laughs> it's not. really all – there's been research on this for years, I mean, mostly for women, about what it does to you to compare your real body to the airbrushed images you see on the covers of magazines. Um, it's not good for your head. It's not good for your body. Um, and that's really what we're talking about is that you know, you've know you got your real life, but what you're seeing on people's Facebook pages, it's airbrushed. Huh. Yeah, it's not it's the whole story. It. Yeah, no, that's true. I know we've already taken up more time than we said, and I told you we were going to go long on this because we're so interested. But I have to wrap it up with this all-knowing summation. Could you tell us the worst piece of advice that you hear 20-year-olds <laughs> often get and, and why it's okay. so bad. What is it? I don't know. Do you, like, do you have one? That, that, oh, oh, oh. What know, is the worst piece yeah, of advice? Yeah, like, um, there's so much. Do you ever go, oh, my God, I know people tell you this. It's not true. Yes. It's it's all the, it's what I was referring to earlier, all these, and I don't mean to be, you know, throwing baby boomers under the bus here, but it's um, it's all these sort of older person cliches who haven't been through the modern day 20s and as a Gen Xer I have also um, that they say it'll all work out have fun while you can you've got all the time in the world worried about it all later and I'm not saying it's really all doom and gloom you can't do that but that's not responsible advice and and that's also it's a fantasy that I think 20 somethings are saddled with that they're supposed to be out there having the best years of their lives and they're going what is wrong with me this is really hard i kind of hate this um so I, I really cringe when i hear people say that it's so funny because i've heard that a lot and i think at first when I, that's why i hated work i was like this is not fun at all everyone said it was gonna be awesome and this is supposed to be the best years of my life yeah yeah, yeah. so mm-hmm. i really appreciate that well again i mean thank you so much for being on the podcast this has been one of one of the most educational for me and i hope for everybody else and you know your book the defining decade why your 20s matter and how to make the most of them now is phenomenal we'll put a link to it on our on our website do you have any other places you want to point our listeners to i know you said you have a, a twitter handle or do you mm-hmm. have a, a personal yep. website you want to um, let them know about? Yeah, I'm. Um, I have a Twitter handle. I'm at Dr. Meg J. Um, M E G J A Y. Um, the book has a Facebook page, The Defining Decade, um, and I have a website uh, at drmegj.com. Awesome. And yeah, I'm sure people will be checking that out because it's been fantastic. And I'm going to tell all my friends anyways, because they, we all have the same questions and I can't wait to dive in deeper in your book. So right. Again, it's not too late for 29 year olds. I promise. <laughs> Good. That's the first thing I needed to hear. So again, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, best of luck with the book and everything like that. And thank you for talking to us 20 year olds who are lost. <laughs> yep, My pleasure. All my right, pleasure. Right. Thanks again. Bye. All right, bye-bye. Ah, that interview was incredible. I'd actually really be interested in hearing what you guys thought about it. If you head over, maybe on Facebook or something, uh, at Smart People Podcast, let us know what you thought. If you if you got something out of it, even if you're not in your 20s or something. Roach, what was your favorite part? What what we talk about? What would you hone in on? Oh, man. Well, the fact that I realized I need to set up a session with her, that's, <laughs> that's number one. And she's close. You know, she's only in Charlottesville, so I might have to find out if she takes my insurance and head head down there. I know. Is it weird that I actually thought in my head, would I drive two hours, you know, each way? And then I realized I probably would because this was a a little therapy session for us. And uh, I hope everybody else out there felt the same. Well, first things first, I'm reading the book. We, you know, we got it from the publisher today. We were able to read some of it. I need to finish it. I need to go through it again because... I wasn't able to ingest everything just in one quick glance at it. I mean, that's just, that's how we prepare for the interview, but I need this for my life. So I'm going to, I'm going to tear through this thing with fine tooth comb. And and again, it's, it's the defining decade, why your twenties matter and how to make the most of them now by Meg J. And yeah, I mean, I'm going to go through and I highlight when I read, it's going to be one yellow mess, the entire book. Just an entire book of highlight. Yeah, so that's all we got for you today. We already have three more incredible interviews in the books, so we'll be firing them out now. We got the new studio. Make sure you subscribe. Go to iTunes and subscribe so you don't have to worry about downloading each week. It'll just be there for your next car trip, when you're stuck in traffic or bored at the office or walking your dog. 
turn on some smart people podcast, learn a little something. And uh, we look forward to catching you next week. Yeah. And if you haven't done it, please rate and comment over at iTunes. That definitely helps us in terms of getting other listeners to check it out. You know, maybe we'll get lucky and get put on one of the front sections again. And the only way to do that is by having people rate. Put it out there. Comment. It's the social media madness. Yeah. And I'll give you guys a little secret. If you're on the iPhone, check out the app Downcast. It's one or two dollars. Totally worth it. I use it for all my podcasts. It automatically downloads the stuff. That way, you don't have to worry about syncing to your computer. So if you're super lazy like Chris and I, we can just have everything download daily to the iPhone. It's pretty sweet. Again, it's called Downcast. And make sure that you subscribe to Smart People Podcast on it. They're not paying us anything. I just personally love the app. And I think it's a great idea for people getting the podcast every time it comes out. It's funny. I was actually going to... You read my mind. I was going to tell you to tell everybody about that because you recently told me and I'm like, oh, great, because I was driving home from New York last weekend, didn't have any recent podcast downloaded, and I said, forget it. I'm getting Downcast, and now it's all set. So, uh, yeah, go to Downcast. Make sure Smart People Podcast is your first selection on there, and you'll never miss another episode. Thanks for listening. Catch you soon.